put it up there. <laughs> so I'm there. Everybody's smoking, and it's so it's so far down there. When you watch, once this gets rolling, people are gonna pile in there. Right, right. Yeah, that last session was there was a lot of people. Yeah, it's so far to go smoke. So Jack. Curtis, you can do what you want. Well, I just, I didn't know if we were trying to say it that time. Well, we, you do what you want, Curtis. You know what to do. They're awesome. We don't have, that's the only donor we have. I guess the, the other one, we didn't even give them shit. And I was wondering we, about that. Yeah. We didn't give them shit. Marty know he's on this time? Absolutely. <laughs> yeah, he absolutely does. Where is he at? <laughs> I don't know. He was in here. <laughs> he'll, he'll make it. He'll I saw him in here. He was up here just a minute ago. <laughs> we were talking about, he sent me his PowerPoint slide. He knows he's on. Okay, is it on the paper or the? It's a little notebook. Right here. Thank God. Yes, ma'am. Hey, Yvette, good to see you. Can we go ahead and get going? Can we go ahead and start? All right, well, good morning, everyone. My name is Curtis Taylor, and I'm a person in long-term recovery. And what that means for me is that I have not used alcohol or any other substance since December 23rd, 2002. I am an alumni of Oxford House Crosslink in Raleigh, North Carolina, the greatest Oxford House to ever be created in the history of Oxford House. Yeah. <laughs> and I'm also the very first reentry coordinator ever established in the state of North Carolina as well. As a matter of fact, it was my journey, um, my return to use and prison experience and coming out and being welcomed back into my Oxford House family that helped drive and motivate the establishment of a reentry coordinator in the first place. Back then, 
there was some reentry initiatives going on in, in the state of Washington, but they were all volunteer. And if I recall correctly, I believe there were some things happening in, in Louisiana. Maybe Marty can fill us in on some of that. Um, but that was it. And now I look around and reentry is popping. And I'm at the 23rd Oxford House World Convention. I want to welcome my beautiful wife, Karen, to her second Oxford House World Convention. Hey, brother. Yeah, that's my little cutie pie in there, right there. And, um, you know, I'm, I'm excited to be here. I'm excited about what's, what's going on. I'm not employed by Oxford House as a staff member any longer. I'm actually the executive director of an agency called the Alcohol Drug Council of North Carolina, where we are that connection to resources for people, regardless of wherever they're coming from, whether it's prison or um, a homeless shelter, um, just anybody that finds themselves in a state of need, we connect them to the resources that, uh, that's going to benefit them. But as you all know, once you're part of this Oxford House family, you're always a part of this Oxford House family. Oxford House runs through my DNA. We are actually running short on time for this panel, but I learned how to facilitate meetings in an Oxford House. <laughs> so I got it. So I want to welcome you guys to the panel for working with parole and prison reentry. Over three quarters of the Oxford House population has done some jail and or prison time. In America today, approximately 60% of those in jails or prisons are addicted to alcohol and or drugs. And each year, thousands of those who are incarcerated reenter society. However, within one year of reentry, about half of those individuals will commit another crime and be headed to convic conviction and reentry into, in into incarceration, excuse me. The experience of those who enter an Oxford House following incarceration is usually long-term recovery and crime-free behavior. In some states, Oxford House has developed relationships with reentry programs that permit those leaving incarceration to go straight into an Oxford House. The recommendation of drug courts or parole officers who have found that their clients tend to do very well if they live in an Oxford House. Not only does such intervention mo motivate clients to begin to master the recovery process, but it also saves taxpayers the cost of incarceration and recidivism. Oxford House residents who enter Oxford House from incarceration are exposed to participatory democracy rather than institutional authority. They are elected to leadership positions and they undertake shared responsibility for the operation of the house. Most residents rise to the occasion. This kind of real life training is rare for most individuals reentering society. Today's panel will discuss, number one, the need for post-incarceration recovery opportunities, two, practical ways to facilitate getting individuals leaving incarceration into an Oxford House, three, how Oxford Houses can help drug court clients achieve long-term recovery and meet the expectations of the drug courts, and four, how Oxford House living, how Oxford House living facilitates the transition to long-term crime-free recovery for most residents. These panelists are all experienced in the field. Today's first panelist will be Mr. Dan Hahn, an Oxford House alumnus and the regional manager for Oklahoma, Nebraska, was that Montana? Oh, and Missouri. I had, I had to check what that abbreviation was. Oklahoma, <laughs> Missouri, and Nebraska. Welcome, Dan. Good morning, everybody. My name is Dan. I've been Dan Hahn. I've been clean and sober since July 18th of 2007. I, I'm really, really blessed to be here today and standing in front of you guys and, and gals. And I know he's up there watching, you know, and happy and proud of all of us. And, you know, we need to keep that at the forefront. We're going to carry this thing on. So, I want to just tell you a little bit about my history. Um, I have DOC numbers in four different states. Um, I didn't, I was into uh, financial crimes and things like that, money crimes. I spent 32 months of my life locked up in different stretches. And um, every time I went to prison, I'd get this grand plan about when I got out and, and how things were going to be different. You know, I actually thought that I'd change how I did my criminal acts and you know, quit doing, doing things this way or that way, 
and it might work for a little bit, and then I invariably end up back. And I got out of, uh, I got out of jail with a 10-year supervised probation sentence in November of 2007, and I walked into a parole office in uh, Jasper County, Missouri, and I said, I need help for the first time. I need help. I said, all the phone numbers I have on this phone, are gonna, I'm going to end up getting high. And I lived in Kansas at the time and wanted to go. I said, I want to go home, and I don't want to call any of these people. And what they explained to me was, is here's a list of homeless shelters. We're not going to let you go home. Um, we're not going to let you go home until you give us some of that restitution you owe us. So I ended up in some different sober livings and, and stumbled into a recovery meeting and found out about Oxford House with approximately six months, six or seven months sober. Um, April of 2008, I moved into the College Hill Oxford House in Wichita, Kansas. And I realized after, after being there a short amount of time, I realized that, man, um, I wish somebody would have told me about this all the times I was getting out. Um, I had no way of knowing, but I firmly believe if somebody would have told me about Oxford House, I might have shaved a couple of those jail trips off. Um, so a long, long time, it's not, you know, it's a long time ago in Oxford House years. Oxford House years are kind of like dog years, but I, 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 I remember, I asked somebody a long time ago, um, how do I get help get people out of prison? And this is, if I could tell you something really important today, because I get calls from people all over the country asking about reentry, and I always tell them you have to figure it out. And that's the best advice that was given to me. You know, every state is different. Uh, sentencing laws are different. But we do have some things that are very common and similar, okay? They're very similar in that. And I'm going to go over a few of those today. And I, I'm not very, I, PowerPoints and me don't disagree, uh, don't agree with each other very well, but this will keep me on track. So when we're talking about helping getting people out of prison, um, I've had a lot of experience and I've spent a lot of time with folks fresh out and, and the day they get out, guys and gals. And then I remember how it was for me. Um, number one, and, and this is kind of off of the PowerPoint, we need to remember that a lot of people come out with a very tough exterior. You know, I've been locked up. I've been doing this. They're scared. They're scared. I was scared. I wasn't going to admit it to anybody, but I was scared to death. I was scared of change. Fear of the unknown. And some things that I've learned over time that are critical, if you're going to reach out and help those coming from incarceration, is a strong presence of recovery in the home. I, I talk to people around the country, and, and well, we can't have more than this many people from prison in the house. That's ridiculous. It's ridiculous. You, can, you have to practice the Oxford House model wrapped around some recovery. Yes, um, there's multiple pathways that all of us are participating in, but it's got to be something. Something. Oxford Houses are recovery homes. Okay? Um, a spirit of tolerance and understanding. Um, from 2013 to 2017, so a four-year period there, I would try as much as possible to pick people up from the bus station, men and women, and take them to the house that they were going to be, going to be living in. And over, over a four-year period, uh, of course, I, I didn't keep track of everyone, but I did realize something. When you spend time with folks and explain to them who we are and what we're about, I saw the, the, the success rate in those folks much greater. We, folks come out of prison, they think, and, and, you know, we've been battling this for years. Think Oxford House, they think Halfway House. I've literally had folks, I, I tell them, I've been accepted to this Oxford House, and I go, well, relax, there's not going to be metal detectors. We're not going to tell you, where you when to come and when to go. And, and within a couple of days, um, I love it here. And, and, you know, and I said, having your home full of selfless truth tellers, um, something that I've realized over the years, if you sit down with one of us coming from incarceration and you tell us what's expected of us, this is okay, this is not okay. This is what we do here. This is what we don't do here. And we, ha and we have a clear understanding. Um, I've seen great success. You know, you, you come into, you let folks coming from incarceration come into a home and coming into an environment where uh, withholding the ability to truth tell, well, it's not my place to tell. It's not, that, that's no good. We have to have a strong home of recovery and work with the residents coming in about what Oxford House is. And we're leaving that prison life at the door. It doesn't have to be like that anymore. 
It doesn't. You're a part of a family. And in this family, we have a good time and we make, we make recovery a priority. Lots of fun and unity in the home. I know uh, a lot of the houses that, that I was a part of living in, we'd always tell people coming in, hey, we go to this meeting hall on Saturday night. And, you know, the first house I moved in, they told me I was going to go there and not live there. But, um, you know, hey, we all go together to meetings. It's just I can't, I can't emphasize enough how incredibly important it is um, to have the spirit of recovery in the home. Because if we come out and no one spends time with us and tells us about our old behaviors and what we have to do to change, we're just going to be the same dry person. And we're going to end up with recidivism and back and starting over. So I, I just can't tell you enough how recovery, recovery, recovery is critical. And in in having a family environment in the home. And then understanding immediate barriers. I'm not going to get into these in detail because some of our panelists are. But as I said before, we come out with fear of the unknown. Um, we need proper identification. I know in, in some of the states that I work in... Um, we have to make it a condition that they at least have a social security card and a birth certificate because the, the resources aren't even there within the Department of Corrections. They'll come out and not have any way to get an ID. And as we all know, it, it, we have to pay our equal expense in Oxford House. So, you know, those are things that we, th those are immediate barriers to folks coming out. Um, food and shelter uh, is critical. Those are the, the barriers that we face. Food and shelter in Oxford House uh, covers the shelter part. and, and in, in practicing the first tradition, we be, we're there to help people get out and get employment, get back in the workforce. It's important. Um, rec um, having guidance to recovery, and it's going back to what I just said, it's a, a, tremendous a tremendous barrier. I've seen so many folks that come out of prison, and they actually don't even know what recovery really is. In their mind, recovery is abstinence. And so it's our job as Oxford Houses to show them what's possible with the recovery program. And then also uh, barriers is being involved in old places and playgrounds. I, I, I can't tell you how often I've had to work with guys and gals and tell them, look, if you have those old phone numbers from before you went in, you got to stay away from that stuff. You have to stay away from it. And, and that's why it's so important that within these houses that we have unity and involvement and we do things together and get them involved in our tribe. You know, it's so important. If, and, I, and I know that's what any, it's that way with any of us. If you move in a house and everybody's in their bedroom watching TV, um, it, the outcomes are going to be bad. Work on unity in a family environment in your home and you'll have a lot better outcomes with the folks you're work, working with. And I'm going to talk just real quick about partnerships. Um, Curtis taught me this years ago, and, and he didn't teach it to me directly. I just heard him say it so many times. When you're working with helping get people out of prison, jails, county jails, um, if homeless shelters, wherever it is, and, and folks are indigent, and you're wanting to build relationships between your chapter, state, Oxford House, individual Oxford House, start at the top. Go right to the top. Try to go at, at, at the, the directors of your Department of Corrections, the directors of the, you know, the, the wardens of the prisons. Whenever you're trying to get information out there about what we do and, and the effectiveness of it, start at the top. Build relationships with your case workers and unit teams. It's incredibly important. Um, show them the benefits of the folks, you know, some su success stories. Um, it's, it's critical. The success stories are what keep us going. And I have people call me from all around the country, you know, sporadically, and they'll say, hey, I'm wanting to, we're wanting to start doing reentry in our area. And the best advice that I could give them is figure it out on their own, number one, get together and, and figure out what works for you, and number two, build an effective relationship with your pro parole and probation officers. Because those are the ones that are going to, the the day-to-day -day work that's going to be with them. Um, I can't emphasize how critical that is. You go right at those probation and parole officers to have them come over to the Oxford House and look at it, say, this is what we're doing. And then, you, of course, your sheriff's departments, county jails, homeless shelters, treatment centers. I know uh, in some of the states I'm involved in, um, folks will be in treatment centers hundreds of miles away. So we'll work with them and just basically treat it the same way as a reentry. Um, 
being flexible with your interviewing, whether it be by application, by Zoom, uh, telephone, however you have to do it, uh, giving folks a chance. So, um, and I want to I want to fall back again and just talk about how critical it is showing showing the direct effects of the good things you're doing in your individual houses. It's 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 imperative. So I believe we are up to our next speaker. Um, I'll turn it back over to Curtis. Thank you all very much. Let's have a hand for Dan. I'm excited about the number of people um, are continuing to fill up this room because, you know, substance use disorder in and of itself is greatly stigmatized. And a lot of people die and don't seek the help that they desperately need because of that stigma. But then incarceration is even further stigmatized, even inside of our recovery community, even inside, unfortunately, of our Oxford House family. I don't want to live with no thief. What did he do time for? How long was he in? Can't have but so many people from prison living in one house. How many people in here been to prison or jail? <laughs> so, so I know you're in this room because you're passionate about reentry. So we're, we're, we're preaching to the choir, so to speak. So we won't belabor it, but please make sure that you go back home. Go back home to your various Oxford houses, your various chapter meetings, state association meetings, those one-on-ones in the living room and at the dining room table, and just remind people who we are. Ask one another, who do we think we are? Make sure we're not allowing our housemates, or any individual for that matter, to continue to look down our nose at another human being. We're not better than, we're not less than. We're all in this together. So next up is this powerhouse named Jesse Wilson, who is also an alumnus of Oxford House, and he is currently the senior reentry coordinator in North Carolina, Jesse. Good morning, family. My name is Jesse Wilson. I'm a person in long-term recovery, and what that means for me is I have not gave myself permission or found the excuse to drink or use since January 21st of 2018. I'll go ahead and give you uh, some examples of my past life. I do call it my past life because I live a new life now. Um, I'm a formerly incarcerated individual. And at one point in time, I was a very unpredictable and dangerous person, and it led me to a state facility. Um, coming up on release, there was a lot of fear wrapped around, where am I going to go? If I go back home, I'm going to continue staying sick. Um, and the programmer told me, well, you have no options but to go back to where you're from. And I'll never forget that because a couple of the last week that I was in prison, I was laying on that top bunk in that prison dorm. And I remember, when you're in prison, you have a long time to look at yourself and look at your life. And I had a long time to sit and really look at what my life had become. Um, but the, the, the thought of getting sober and working a job and being a father and being a good person and doing the next right thing was so monumental that it was beating me before I could ever get started. Well, it's very important that I didn't know nothing about Oxford House. I wish every good man and woman in behind the walls and fences of a prison knew about Oxford House. Because there, there are good people behind them walls and fences. I asked God to come into my heart and show me. And the reason I know that God came into my heart is because after that, I never could get comfortable drinking and using again. And that's the reason why I stand before you today. But the day that I relapsed was the day that I got out of prison. And I found Oxford House, had no idea what it was. And I remember the first person that I spoke to on the phone, he was living at a new Oxford House, and his name's Goose Wise. And I told him, I said, I said, I'm, I'm a bad person, and I don't know if I deserve this chance, because that's what I thought of myself, because most of us have very low self-esteem when we come in. And I'll never forget what he told me. He says, it doesn't matter what you do, what you have done before you walk through the doors of this Oxford house. It only matters what you do after. 
and out. Wouldn't it be nice if everybody had that mentality? Now we're going to talk about some uh, and, and some stigma. We ever heard the, the term uh, convict, felon, uh -oh, run them together, convicted felon, you know. <laughs> what about prisoner? Oh, what about the inmate? Yeah, offender, all that, you know. Do not dare put them labels on us. We are human beings in recovery, trying to do the best that we can and stay clean and sober today doing the next right thing, trying to get our lives back. That's who we are. We're not numbers after our names, which they give us whenever we're cage-like animals. That's not who we are. Now, how, how should we, how dare us pass judgment on somebody trying to get better? Okay, so, you know, over the course of the four years that I've been working with, uh, with as a reentry coordinator for North Carolina, I have heard people say, well, we don't want them, those kind of people in our houses, okay? Well, I looked around the hands that was up and seen how many people had been to prison. I wish that there wasn't so many hands up so that we could continue open minds, you know, because we're like-minded individuals in this room, but where are the people at that we should open their mind? You know, that, that's, the, that's the people that we need in here. There's whole areas, and the reentry initiative wouldn't exist if it wasn't for the houses democratically giving people a chance. That was the way I came up in Oxford House. Give this person a chance, because the accountability level was high in this house. Okay, well, it takes less votes to vote someone out than it does to vote them in for a reason. With that being said, we hold them accountable. Give them a chance. How are we going to know that this, this person might not save their own life? Or let us help them save their life, because we are in the business of saving lives. We're not in the bus business of saying, we don't want those people. Okay. We're human beings trying to do the best that we can. We need to show love and tolerance for the individuals coming from prison. Let me elevate this up another level. If your house accepted somebody from prison and you told somebody else, yeah, we got this new reentry guy, that man has a name, let's get away from the labels completely. This person just returned home from prison. You know, this is a returning citizen. Okay, so, so what's it look like whenever somebody gets there? Mike M. right there done 11 years in some of the worst places you could be in North Carolina. When he came home, they, he, there was so much fear wrapped around this man, he, could, he couldn't leave the house for three days. Okay. Now, when we vote a member in, whether they come from prison treatment, let me back that up just a second. I, I called somebody just the other day trying to advocate for an individual that I believed in, and uh, he said, well, the last four guys from prison didn't work out. Well, what about the last 10 people from treatment centers? <laughs> you know what I mean? If you have that mentality, you're going to start running out of places to take interviews. Oh, the last four people from the streets didn't work out. So we're just not taking no more interviews at all. <laughs> just because that them four people didn't work out does not mean that fifth one won't because I'm that fifth one. And so are y'all. Who re-entered society right into an Oxford house that's in this room? Congratulations to y'all. <laughs> you know, in North Carolina, uh, we have three re-entry coordinators, and just last year alone, we helped facilitate interviews and secured home plans for 254 individuals. <laughs> so business is good, you know, business is good. But when that person gets, gets there, they're in shock. See, I knew how to move in the street. I knew how to move in prison, but I did not know how to move in an Oxford house. I, got, I come in there, and I'm like, show me my room. That's all I want to be at, you know. The best thing Oxford House ever done was shove me through the doors of Alcoholics Anonymous, which I still work a program today. And it says that the purpose of Alcoholics Anonymous is to stay sober and help others achieve sobriety, not the ones that I want to pick. Others, me, you. You know, we're brothers and sisters in this thing called recovery. But what's it going to look like? Now, the reentry does not exist without houses being open-minded enough to accept individuals coming out of prison and incarceration. It does not exist. If you live in an area where there's nobody coming from prison or jail, then that's be you might want to look at some houses. 
We need to open minds, and the best way to open minds is having a successful, successful person come from prison and go to the chapter meeting. Hey, I come from prison, and it was because of these men voted me into this house. I have a life today. That's what changes minds, period. And with that being said, we may, it, depending, on the, <laughs> depending on the time that they've been incarcerated, they may need a day or two to get readjusted. This isn't like returning from the treatment center. This is adjusting to society as a whole. You know what I mean? So with that being said, this person has to get it. If he's been down, I, I helped facilitate a placement with a guy that's been down for 40 years. He had armed robbery in the, in the early 80s, and back then they just laid people down for that. And then the new law passed, and they wouldn't try, try him on the new law. And when he come out, he had no idea what he was coming out to. Do you realize how much things change in 40 years? I don't. I haven't even been alive that long. This person was shell-shocked. Well, it's going to take us having love and tolerance, which is also our code, to show this person some love. This person hasn't had a good meal in years. Okay, but I tell you, I see, I see a lot of people come out and be, be grateful. That gratitude's what keeps us sober and clean. Still to this day, it does. But when I interview, see in North Carolina, we are, we are blessed enough to be able to interview these men and women. And one of the things that I look for is what we call the gift of desperation. See, I was desperate enough to do anything that I had to not to go back to the way I was living. And today, I still stand before you willing to go to any length to stay sober. And there's thousands more just like me and you. So, we look for the gift of desperation. Because our hands has to be up. We have to be broken before we can be rebuilt. I believe that. Because I came in a very broken person. Okay, but what's that look like when somebody comes? Okay, they, they may not have an identification card, secu social security card. They don't know where jobs are. They're in a new city. They didn't want to go back to where they're from. Just like Mike. Where's Travis at? Travis is in here too somewhere. But anyways, what's that look like? Well, we may need to take this person. We, we may need to take time to sit down with this person and help them apply for a social security card. Take them to the social service department. We may need to take time to help this person. And that's okay. Somebody done it with us. Right? Somebody helped us. So if we forget where we come from, ladies and gentlemen, that is a very dangerous place to be in your sobriety. Very dangerous. Because I heard a wise man say, if you forgot your last one, it ain't happened yet. Think about that. So we need to remember where we come from. And remember that we've been caged up like an animal. With that being said, we, we have formed reentry subcommittees throughout North Carolina, and what these subcommittees do is help add extra support for the returning citizen, the returning brother or sister. What that may look like is showing up the day, of the, the day or two after his release and sitting down with that man or woman and saying, hey, look, we're a part of the reentry subcommittee, and show that and empathize, empathize with that person. You know, hey, I've been where you're at. Even if you have not been to prison, you can empathize emphasize, ah, whatever the word is, um, but you can sit with that person and there's a level of understanding that we need to have. With an open mind, we'll understand, hey, if you're having a hard time, call. Because if we knew how to stay clean and sober, well, we wouldn't be here, would we? We have learned from people, remaining teachable. Am I out of time? But if, if you form reentry subcommittees, figure out how you can best serve the people that's returning home to Oxford Houses. Look around your areas for reentry councils, you know, reentry organizations, peer support organizations that help with the social determinants of health, every aspect of this person. And if you're sitting here thinking, well, we don't have nothing like that where we're from, have you even looked? You know, take time for yourself and, and like minded individuals to, to form a subcommittee to help. Thanks for letting me speak. Good job. Good. Well, these first two sure brought it. Another round for a uh, round of applause for Jesse. Oh, wow. Okay. Next up, we've got Mr. Marty Walker, who's an Oxford House alumnus and the senior outreach coordinator in the state of Tennessee. Marty Walker.
South Foot. Hey, I got to tell you, my name's Marty. I'm a dope fiend that's been sober and clean since March 15th of 1998. For that, I'm truly great. And uh, I got to tell you a story. It was in North Carolina. I was at a banquet. They were a Saturday night banquet. I don't know if you guys remember this. And uh, I was speaking. And I, right before, like, I went to the bathroom, and I was on way to the podium, and I met this guy uh, that had just got out of jail, like, five, ten minutes ago. And <laughs> he was on his way to Oxford House, but the police took him to the Oxford House, the PO took him to the Oxford House, and the, nobody was home at the Oxford House. And they said, man, we got to take you to the, we got to take you where the Oxford House people are. We got to, we got to take you over here to the Hilton. Remember that? Yep. And it was the Saturday night bank where everybody's all dolled up and stuff. So can you imagine, dude been in jail for like a year and a half. Got a little bag of legal papers and stuff. Anybody ever been there? You know? <laughs> and he, we got to take you. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Nobody's at home. We're going to take you to the Hilton <laughs> with 300 other Oxford House people all dolled up and stuff. Now, from the jail cell to the Hilton. A meet like within 10 minutes, dude's like, you know, what am I doing? How cool would that be, you know? Um, and I, I, so I, I, I've always remembered that guy, you know, because um, that's how this is. That's how when you move into Oxford House and you, the, we, there's only one promise, the, the, the gift of freedom from active addiction. You got that. Man, the sky's the freaking limit. So uh, we all kind of like came. Well, how many people here were in jail? I'm sorry, there's two or three? Oh, oh, there's a lot more than two or three. So we went from the concrete slab in the stainless steel sink. Where are we at now? The freaking Regency Hyatt. We're in Hyatt in Seattle, huh? If you didn't think you had anything to be grateful for, you ain't on, you ain't sitting on that freaking stainless steel that thing is cold man huh yeah you got to put the little toilet paper the little one ply state paper down and just sit on yeah so remember all that we ain't got to live like that today you know because we have uh freedom from active addiction so that right there um to go from like the lowest frequency you could be living at living like an animal, or that's where my addiction took me, is, is living like an animal, you know, um, to, I mean, hell, look, you got to look good. I just wanted to say that, you know. Uh, we clean up good. And uh, this, the biggest stigma I think that we face is the one that's internal. That was the one for me. Because when I came right out of, right out of prison into, like, I couldn't believe that they were even going to vote me in, you know. I mean, like, I'd never been part of the human race before. I'd never tried to stay sober, you know. Uh, so I move into an Oxford house, and I can't I don't even know how to go grocery shopping, you know. So I'm, like, I'm a product of the state because by the time my family kicked me out in 1978, and I finally moved into an Oxford house, and my first one was March 25th of 1994. So that was... 16 years of just, and 13 years of that was back and forth to the penitentiary. You know, I'm state raised. It's like, and those are the only tools I had. And, I, and I'm saying all that to say this, all that street credibility that we nurture and we, oh, that dude, you know, he's solid, man, but freaking. I move in Oxford House and ain't none of that mean a damn bit of difference. You ain't got your money order, you know. <laughs> they don't give a damn. You didn't do your chore. We don't give a damn. You, ain't, you didn't do your chore. $25 fine, man. It's like, what? <laughs> wait, wait. You don't, don't, we, don't you? Uh, no. We don't. That shit was back then. Now it's now. Now it's now. Now what are you doing? You know, and the cool thing about Oxford House is, like, it takes a minute. Like, I think they touched on that. It takes a minute. You know, um, I, I got in a little groove. And I want you guys to realize, well, there's so many funny things that's happened. Um, like, I'll go back to a house that struggled. I think I did this in Louisiana. I went back like four years later. And they had, they had like six vacancies. There's like three guys in the house. 
and we had voted we had voted to not take anybody from jail we had also voted that you have to have a car to live here we voted that you have to have college education we voted that your hair has to be parted on the right you know i'm like well that you're you know all that like not remembering where you came from that's why your house is struggling now the chapter um now you need money from the chapter so the chapter has voted that you will be taking uh, <laughs> residents from the from jail. It's like, you know, and, and the person, and I'm the guy that opened this house, and I've spent 13 years of my life in jail. So how you're going to live in an auction house opened by somebody that was in jail, and uh, you know we get real picky, you know. Paul Malloy taught me one thing. It's like we need to diversify our houses, you know. Um, this there's a little poem right here. Um, if we could look, I hate reading, I always freaking cry. If we could look into each other's hearts and understand our challenges, we could treat each other much more gently with more love, patience, tolerance, and care. You know? You guys have so much ability to help the person that nobody else could help. Nobody could help us. It took us to help us, you know? Probably everybody in this room, and I probably share that, we were the people that everybody gave up on, you know? The POs, we're just tired of you. Police told me they were going to kill me if they had to keep arresting me. They said, you're, Mr. Walker, you're not learning your lesson. We're getting tired of you. They told me they would do that. Then I realized, ooh, this isn't this isn't a game anymore. They were really getting tired of it. So, um, the cool thing about the house that I moved into was that they had some little beans and rice. If you didn't have any money, I had money. I had a little job before I moved in. But like they would, if you need sheets, you know, you when they, <laughs> how many people have moved into a room and they didn't even clean the room before you moved it? Oh God. They would clean our room. They would put, they would have, you know, like literature, uh, recovery literature in the room. They made sure you're, you had bedding, uh, clean towels. They had a little bag of toothpaste, uh, you know, shower gel, because they got tired of people stealing their toothpaste and their shower gel. So um, they would have a little care package, you know, and they would tell me, they would tell me, we're not responsible to get you to work but we'll tell you where the bus is. We'll, we'll sit down and we'll take you to meetings at night. So that empathy, you know, it, the worst thing we can do is when we accept people in, is like, here's your room, here's the remote, I got to go. You know, that could be death, a, a death sentence. Because when you move into an Oxford house, you're buying into the system of family. Didn't we talk about family earlier? We're family, man. How's the new guy? We they would wait up for me to come home. It's like, how was your day? Because they were they were genuinely genuinely concerned about my well-being. I was in a house where they didn't uh, allow cable in the rooms. We had to sit if we wanted to watch TV. We'd have to go to the living room and talk to everybody. It's like, oh my God, how horrifying would that be? You know, I just want to do my own thing. I want I want to have my own apartment in an Oxford house. You know, I want to isolate. You know, uh, I want to have my own bathroom. I need my own single room. I don't want to really, I just, if I got a back door, I'd want to use that. It's like, that's some dope fiend stuff. Be careful with that. You know, check on your roommates every day, maybe even throughout the day. Because unfortunately, we've had people pass away in the house. Almost on a daily basis, you know. So I, th I really like the, the, the thing about family. And Tennessee, we don't, we're not D TDOC approved, Tennessee Department of Corrections. But we do get people coming in from corrections. You know, it's voluntary. And we deal with a lot of drug court people. I love, I'm a product of drug court. When I relapsed, I had got me a new case, you know. But I was in drug court for a year, 99. I graduated and I've been sober ever since. Um, just because. 
I mean, it's a whole different ball game. But just remember, like, I, the it was like I was in a blur. I had never been on the streets sober. I'd never been sober, much less out of prison with money in my pocket and people that cared about me. Uh, that was all new to me, you know. Um, and so we, we really rely on you guys to show them the roadmap. And the cool thing about you guys and us as a team, as a family, because we're all family here. We really are. We don't all get along. Or maybe you guys do, but we don't, you know. Um, and uh, so you guys know the roadmap out of the pits of hell. So you guys can go back in there and pull them out. You know, just pull them out. Just go back in there. You know the way out. You know, show them and teach them to go back in there. Because together, that's how we got to 3,300 houses. That's what I got for you, man. Thank you. The road map out of the pits of hell. My man, Marty Walker. Oh, I know this lady. Next up, we've got Lynn Williams. She brought her fan club. Huh? Lynn Williams is an Oxford House alumna. She's a recovery advocate. And she is the team lead at my agency, the Alcohol Drug Council of North Carolina. Ladies and gentlemen, Lynn Williams. Hi, family. Um, I'm real honored to be up here with this um, powerhouse. You know, um, my predecessors and all that. And um, I just need to qualify myself. I am a woman in long-term recovery. And what that means to me is I haven't found it necessary to use any mood or mind-altering substances since October 15, 2009. Um, I am justice served, and um, 58 felonies later, I'm grateful that it, that's not what defines me, OK? Um, today, I get to be that better half, that sister, um, that aunt. I get to be that employee. But most of all, I get to be a nana. And um, that's the greatest hat that I wear. Uh, walking out of the gates of prison after a few months or whether it's a few years, uh, it can be very intimidating. Um, you don't know what, when, how, why, you know, your immediate thoughts are that of hopelessness. And um, it can be debilitating, that fear. That fear can hold us back from doing a whole lot of things. Uh, without any real support, um, we certainly have a reason to quit. But that's where Oxford House comes in. Um, we are those people that can provide that housing um, that immediate need, that shelter. Because once I have shelter, then I have somewhere to lay my head, wash my clothes, take a shower, you know, and I can feel at home. But so often we hear, we don't think they'll be a good fit. <laughs> <laughs> or we don't need no thieves in our house. Do they have a job? Or we don't do mental health. We don't do gays. We don't do HIV. You know? Why not? We, just a few 24 hours ago, I was that thief. Okay? So we got to remember who we are, what we are, and where we came from. We already feel awkward and out of place, and we're wondering what everybody knows about us and all that. Um, so, you know, we're looking around, and they see us 
we have a job, we might have a car, we have some new Jordans on or, you know, or at least we got some clean sneakers, right? And, and we're smiling and laughing and they're saying, oh my God, I want to have fun too. They don't quite know how. But that's where we come in again. We teach them. Whenever you accept a returning citizen to your house, be patient. Be of service and be your sister or brother's keeper. Have a food shelf in your house. You know, everybody leaves food sometimes. Make sure you have food for that person. And like someone else said, oftentimes they haven't had a good meal. Can you imagine being locked up for 40 years? Even food has changed in 40 years, right? So we want to give them a, a, a meal, you know, prepare a, a home meal for them. That's an opportunity for your house to get together. It's the simple things that count. Have the bed made up, you know, a washcloth and a towel, maybe some toiletries. The bus schedule for your area. What does your area use? Passes, tokens, tickets? What do they use? Have a couple of them for them. Maybe you can buddy up with them and get on the bus and show them how to get where they're going. Proper identification is a huge barrier. Oftentimes people get out, the only thing they have is their prison ID. Well, we all know that that doesn't work, okay? Um, we need a birth certificate, we need um, an ID to get an ID. Yeah, yeah. And sometimes it costs money. So we want to make sure that we know the places that will help them to get that ID. Where do they need to go? How do they need to go about doing this? Um, and we also know that many services can be denied or delayed if they don't have ID. A lot of times you can't get a job without an ID. So we want to make sure that we have, the, have some information for them. It's not the responsibility of outreach or um, in our area, we have peer advocates. Um, it's the resource coordinators. It's not the responsibility of them solely. You know, we wanna take responsibility for our house because we're only as strong as the weakest link, okay? So we wanna help them to be as strong as we are. We want to keep our pulse on community businesses that give second chances. You know, if you know your job is hiring, put a word in for them. Help them, lead them, guide them. Always remember um, that <clears throat> you just tell them that they have to do 30. We, we don't just tell people that they have to do 30 meetings in 30 days. How about take them to the meeting? How about introduce them to some winners so that they can get on the track of winning too, okay? We want to discourage them from using. Thank you, thank you. We want to discourage them from returning to um, using in old areas and encourage them to build a foundation of recovery, meetings, sponsor, network, job, and most of all, we want to encourage them to get involved in Oxford House. Medical care is where um, there are many places that uh, offer medical care for persons who do not have insurance. And of course, getting out of prison or out of jail, most of the times we don't have that insurance. We, so what I'm gonna ask each one of you to do is be prepared to come out of your room. Open your door, okay? Offer some support, offer some training, offer some hope. Uh, oftentimes, persons of color and women face even more barriers in the community, and it can be overwhelming and very discouraging. But once again, it's an opportunity for Oxford House to de demonstrate the model at its finest. The Substance Abuse Mental Health Services Administration, SAMHSA, offers a national helpline uh, in every state to offer information and resources to its citizens. 
in North Carolina, that is the Alcohol Drug Council. And I get the privilege every day of helping to guide someone to take that first step. You know how hard it is to pick that phone up and say, I need help. And they've never had any help before. You know, I talk to mothers and fathers who have mortgaged their homes, grandparents crying because they found their grandchild on the floor in the bathroom, you know. But I also get to talk to that person who has decided to make a change. And oftentimes, I get to say, have you ever heard of Oxford House? Make sure that I'm sending them somewhere that they're going to be welcomed, that they don't have to be stigmatized, you know. We're trying to set up something now, and uh, in the jails we have kiosks where they can call us directly, you know. We want to make sure that everybody has an opportunity to recover, but we want them to recover with the resources and the information Okay, so I'm going to give you the number. It's 1-800-662-4357. That's 1-800-662-HELP. Give us a call and let's connect. Let's give it up for Lynn Williams, y'all. If I had about 20 more of her, I'd be doing something real good. I, I was thinking about uh, that road map Marty was talking about, and, and I couldn't help. I had, kind of had to chuckle to myself a little bit. I, I was a freaking Uber driver in hell, a tour guide in the pits of hell, y'all. Uh, that, that's who and what I'd become. Um, and, and just the, the, the gratitude that you bust up out of hell with, understanding that it didn't have to be. That's that gratitude that drives us every day. Um, December will be 20 years since I used anything, right? And even to this day, I, I still personally deal with stigma, um, fighting to get life insurance for myself, right? Because of my past, 20 years later. I'm, a, I'm an African-American male in America I'm a person in recovery from substance use disorder. I too have felonies on, on my record. And I'm an Alabama Crimson Tide football fan. Oh. There's so many people that hate me, y'all. No. <laughs> Roll Tide, baby. Roll Tide. Last but not least, we've got Miss Nicole Hoskins who's also an Oxford House alumna, and she's an outreach worker right here in the state of Washington. Give it up for Nicole. Oh my. <laughs> Good morning, family. My name's Nikki. I'm a woman in long-term recovery. Whew. Mm. I'm also formally known to the state of Washington as number 718423. Mm. I don't have to live like that today. Okay. I'm really grateful to be here. I'm grateful to be on this panel. I've watched a few of these individuals on panels for years and never in my wildest dreams did I ever imagine that I would be up here. This is amazing. I know I'm really nervous. <laughs> Woo. Okay, so I'm going to share some of my personal and professional experience. I've kind of made some bullet points because I get sidetracked a lot. My favorite color is shiny. <laughs> ah. So the first thing that I want to touch on is um, the first few hours to 24 hours of release. Um, if an individual can transition from prison into a safe and stable environment, such as an Oxford house, within your first few hours to 24 hours of release, the chances of their success increase greatly. Oh, yeah. 
I believe this with all my heart because the first two times I released from prison, I got loaded the same day I got out. I didn't have a safe and stable environment to transition to, and even though when I was incarcerated, I was what they would consider a model inmate, um, I did everything that was required of me. I've always wanted to be clean. I've always wanted to do good. I always wanted to be something not only myself, but my family can be proud of. Um, but I didn't really know any different, so I went back to what was easiest, and I got loaded. But my third and final time, releasing from prison. This is where my story is a little bit different. It's not special, but a little different than most. I actually went to prison at 17 months clean from my Oxford house. I fully believe that my higher power introduced me to Oxford house during that time because I knew that my life there was a bigger plan for me. And if my higher power wouldn't have introduced me to Oxford House during that 17 months of being clean, I probably wouldn't be here today because I would have made the same choices that I always made because I didn't know anything different. But what I learned in that 17 months of being in Oxford House, I learned to be accountable, responsible. I held a job. I started being reunited with my children and my family. And even though that I was living a nightmare, at that time, being faced with going back to prison after the first time in my life that I was actually doing something right, my sponsor, <laughs> she got me to change my perspective a click um, because I did do everything to try and not go back to prison. I did hair follicle tests, I did polygraph tests. It was destined. I was going to prison no matter what. But she said, Nicole, What if you were going there to share your experience, strength, and hope with the individuals behind bars that may or may not ever get to hear about an Oxford House or a program of recovery? <laughs> and so that's what I did. I went there with a smile on my face the day, the day I was handcuffed, and I went. And I shared with everybody and anybody that would listen about what Oxford House had done for me and what the program of recovery had done for me and how I changed my life. And those last few weeks that I was incarcerated, and I'm sure some of you that have been incarcerated know what I'm talking about. You go through this battle um, where it's kind of like good and evil. Uh, you know, part of you wants to continue on doing the things that you want to do. You want to be something that people can be proud of. You want to go and you're going to do all these amazing things, right? Um, but then there's another part of you that wants to celebrate because you've been locked up. You want to go see all those old using friends um, and show them that you just got out of prison. Uh, but this time, this time since my higher power had blessed me with the knowledge of Oxford House, I didn't get to make that same choice that I'd made in the past. I went straight into an Oxford house. I got a job, accountability, responsibility. I started um, getting involved with not only my house, but the chapter, state association, uh, later to become outreach. And, and that allowed me to be able to reach more people in houses and chapters. Um, because sometimes I hear things like, uh, we democratically voted not to accept free in a house. And I'm like, are you out of your mind? Um, I don't understand that. And then I asked them, um, asked them questions like, you know, have you drove drunk? Have you uh, drove high? Have you bought drugs? Have you sold drugs? Have you bought, brought people to do any of those things that could have got you landed in prison just as easy as I was? Um, some people are open-minded, some are not, but for the most part, um, I get to let them know, hi, I'm your outreach worker, my name's Nikki, and I've been to prison three times, and get to show them what I've done to change my life and where I am today and where I came from. Um, I also, um, through this process, one of the ladies that I was incarcerated with, ironically, um, her name was Clarissa, she's not here today, but uh, she's been an instrumental part in the reentry in, in my area in Pierce County for the last few years, and uh, we were incarcerated at the same prison, and 
we ended up in the same area working together. And because of her advocating and diligence and all of us working together um, in that area, every single house in the Pierce County area accepts reentry into their house today. <laughs> we let them know some of the incentives and, um, like, and I'll just say a few, but uh, DOC pays all of their EES. They are, um, they are more accountable. A lot of the times when they're released, um, they're on supervision, probation, whatever the case may be, and there's a lot more accountability there. Uh, they have to answer to DOC. They get UAs. Um, they have a seven-page application process, and, I mean, that's a lot more than the application process that any of us go through when we're interviewing at a house. Um, in our specific area in Washington State, they interview in front of the counselors, so the likelihood of them lying about their infractions and, and things they're doing to better their life and, you know, their goals when they get out, because the counselor will probably call them out. Um, they're required to work and go to classes. Um, I, I just think that there's a lot more accountability with reentry individuals than there are uh, just members in houses. Um, so I think that giving people a chance, I mean, what if people wouldn't have given us a chance and look where we're at today. The last thing I want to touch on is um, the greeting. Uh, that's been very important to me. Um, and when I was living in the house, having a pillow for them, because um, I don't know about any of you all, but the prison I was in, we didn't have pillows. Um, we were wrapping our jeans up in towels or shaking that little mattress that they had very much to the end to try and get some comfort. So having a pillow is amazing. Um, and food, I've heard food, that's incredible. If you have the ability to help them uh, have a good meal when they come home and, and see that they're going through anxiety and fear. And if you don't have uh, somebody that's experienced with reentry in your house, to have somebody there to greet them um, and help them with that process, because there is a lot of anxiety and fear behind that. I know I was terrified, and my longest sentence was 50 months, so I can imagine, I can't even imagine 40 years and things like that. Um, but I will say, my sponsor, um, she took me to eat a Red Robin burger when I got out, and this makes me already want to cry again. But we now call it the Red Robin Crying Burger because when I took a bite of it, it was like the best thing I've ever had in my entire <laughs> life. And I just started bawling because I was so grateful. Yeah. But today, um, I love to give back and I'm a strong advocate for reentry. And today, because of Oxford House, I can stand here before you. Give us a chance. Thank you. Oh, yeah. Let's give it up for Lynn Williams, Nicole Hoskins, Dan Hahn, Jesse Wilson, and Mr. Marty Walker. I think it's about time to eat. Everybody go and be good to yourself, and most importantly, be good to one another.